Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to BC 309. The recording is on. We're going to get our class started. Uh, could I request somebody to please uh, pray? And then we'll start. Anybody? Could just lead us in prayer this morning. I can pray, Pastor. Go ahead, Hope, please. Father, we bless you for this nice day that you have lavished to us, and uh, we are very proud of it because it is by your grace we are here. Mm. And this time we're going to learn from you, O oh God. <clears throat> we ask your Holy Spirit to help us to understand your miseries. We pray for our pastor, Ashish, that we're going to help him to explain to us those your willingness in our life. Father, we pray that you are going to change us through this cause and that we are going to save you in a good order that you want us to reach. Thank you, Father, for each one of us who have joined the class and I ask for your Holy Spirit to help us to understand all that we are going to learn today. I pray in Jesus' name and I believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Hope, and welcome, everyone, this morning. We are continuing this course on BC 309, Urban Church Planting. Uh, we're just going to pick up from where we stopped last week. We had um, one class last week where we um, just introduced in the course and got started. Um, we just went through a little bit about my own personal journey in uh, starting uh, small groups, fellowships, and so on. And then we came up until this point where we said, as we think about starting churches and ministries in our urban centers, our first priority is to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, right? Now, just to quickly recap or mention once again, why we are doing this course. We are doing this course because globally we are seeing a, a, a movement, a, a migration of people towards urban centers. It could be small towns, it could be towns, or it could be large cities. People are moving, of course, for many reasons, practical reasons, uh, for jobs, for better uh, access to access to better facilities, uh, uh, so on. So there is this movement of people, and uh, uh, cities, towns, are a great opportunity for us to reach people, and uh, it also gives us opportunity to reach people from many different backgrounds, because in a city. I, you don't have just the people, you know, from that region. You many, many times you have people from all over. They're right there in that city. So it's a tremendous opportunity. But it is also very complex. It's very challenging because, uh, you know, there are many variables as far as city is concerned. We'll talk about that uh, as we progress. So there's a tremendous opportunity. And this is this is the trend that is going to continue. There is going to be a constant movement of people towards cities. And so we, as ministers of God, uh, we need to prepare ourselves. How do we minister in cities, whether you're planting a church or any other kind of ministry that you're planning to do in an urban setting? What are some things that we have learned and so that we can you know, reach people and serve the Lord better? So the first thing we said is, uh, even, even though in, in this course, we're going to be talking about all these practical things, and I'm going to you know, share with you, you know, do, do this and do this and so on, and we must never forget, ultimately our dependence is on the Holy Spirit, on God to work through us. Right? Psalm 127 was one, a very familiar scripture, it says, if the Lord does not build the house, those who labor, they labor in vain. In other words, if God's not building it, if God's not building the work, 
if God is not in it, then all our efforts really will amount to nothing. Or Jesus put it, put, brought out the same truth, but he put it in a different way. He said, you know, I'm the wine, you are the branches. If the branch doesn't abide in the wine, it doesn't bring forth fruit. And he said, without me, you can do nothing. Right? So, both these metaphors, that of building a house or the wine and the branches, are telling us that, look, in the work we do and the fruit that we bear, it's only going to come from God, our connection with God. You know, God has to do it through us. Right? So, whatever work that God has called you to do in the city, whether to plant a church or start some other kind of ministry, and you know, of course, if some of you are called to work in smaller settings in a town or a village, or doesn't matter, the same things apply there as well. You know, our dependence is on God. And a very important thing is when we labor, we must keep in mind that our increase comes from God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, Paul says, you know, one man waters, one man sows, another man waters, but God gives the increase. So, you know, we could sow, we can water, but only God can give the increase. The increase comes from God. Right? We do our part, of course, of sowing and watering. And we must do it properly, must do it well, do it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And then all increase comes from God. We depend on God for the fruit, for the growth, for the impact that comes from God. Right? And Jesus, you know, is teaching us uh, in John chapter 4, Jesus said, you know, we are gathering fruit unto eternal life. John chapter 4, 35, 36, you know, we are gathering fruit for eternal life. So imagine, you know, uh, the, the result of the work we do, its outcome is lasting for eternity. We are gathering fruit for eternal life. So, you know, in contrast to natural work, which of course we all must do, uh, natural work, day-to-day -day work, of course, its impact is natural. Its impact is here and now. But in the spiritual work we are doing, Jesus is saying we are going, we are going to gather fruit for eternal life, and for eternity. It's going to last beyond here and now. And what the Apostle Paul brings out for us in 1 Corinthians 3, 12-15 is, you know, when we are doing this kind of work, where we are gathering fruit for eternal life, we have to be careful how we do it. We can do it by natural means, earthly means, wood, hay, and stubble, or we can do it with divine means, with, with, with gold, silver, and precious stones. And only what is from God, gold, silver, precious stones, when we build with that kind of material, that will stand the test of fire that will be eternal so this is some things to keep in mind you know we in this course uh, uh, and i'm repeating myself here in this course i'm going to talk we're going to talk about all these practical things you know but don't forget that everything has to be done under the leadership and guidance of the holy spirit otherwise these things mean nothing Okay, so so in First Corinthians 3, 12 to 15, Paul says, you know, you can build a house. You can build it with wood, hay, or stubble, or you can build it with gold, silver, and precious stones. The contrast is, you see, we can all build a house, but what do you use to build it will make all the difference. If you build it by purely natural fleshly means, it may look like a nice house, but, you know, when it is tested by fire, it's all going to go away. But instead, if you build a house with divine means, with what comes from God, that will stand the test. Right? So in this course, 
uh, we are going to discuss natural methods and means. We're going to talk about practical things that we can do. And uh, but remember, everything is subject to God working through us and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, the other thing I want to just say is that it takes wisdom. Uh, it requires wisdom to take a city. In Proverbs 21, you know, 22, uh, it talks uh, you know, about a wise man, the man through his wisdom. Let me look at it, Proverbs 21. You can turn with me there if you have your Bible then. Proverbs 21, verse 22, he says, A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. Proverbs 21, verse 22. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold, the trusted stronghold. So it takes wisdom to capture the heart of the city and to transform the city. And it takes wisdom. So we must look to God for wisdom, where each one of us, you know, where whichever city God has placed you, whichever area that you're working in, look to God and say, God, give me wisdom to show up for me to know how to impact my city. How can I make a difference in my city? How can I take my city, so to speak? How can I influence, you know, the community or the communities or the people in the city that you want me to um, uh, impact and touch, right? So, Let's just, uh, you know, uh, open up a little time for discussion. Uh, let's, um, you know, when you and I are doing ministry, and you and I are, you know, either planting a church and or starting a ministry, what are the struggles that we have in trying to balance the two? That is, our plans and organizing and strategizing and and listening to the holy spirit you know what 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 the kind of challenges we would face or struggles we go through right uh, if any of you have uh, experienced that feel free to share it this is not to uh, it's not to you know judge or criticize anybody it's more for us to learn from each other so you know in your ministry what have you found difficult in trying to balance listening to the Holy Spirit and developing strategies and ideas and so on. Anybody can share, uh, just for us to learn, learn from each other, okay? This is, uh, this is not about you know, criticizing, judging anybody. Uh, whatever you share will be of benefit to somebody else. Okay, so I see Kennedy's um, thought there. Uh, uncertainty lack of funds okay that is true uh, all of us uh, would think of that you know when we want to start something uh, we think about it you know in fact uh, that's a very common thing and it's definitely something we have to think about Sri Kumar uh, you raised your hand yeah um, the lack of leadership mentorship was there and uh, there was no proper direction and uh, a lot of um, like uh, feeling that nothing is moving mm -hmm. and, uh, so that is few things uh, which i should say yeah. mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. this is very true you know especially as a young minister as a young person uh, as you're getting ready to start a ministry you wish you had somebody to talk to and guide you and uh, interact with and um, you know, mentor you, so to speak, to kind of journey with you, help you in the process, you know, um, to encourage you and so on. That definitely is a very valid point. Hope, you wanted to say something? Yes, Pastor. Uh, though I, I do not have a ministry, but uh, I can share what I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think also, uh, it it's give us difficulty because uh, we have poor intimacy with God. We do not have a good relationship with God we save. So we do not uh, trust in Him because 
God needs us to trust him as Abraham did. Abraham mm. trusted God and, and moved from his country and he goes a place where he didn't know. Mm. And he didn't have money, he didn't have anything, but he trusted, mm. he had faith. He believed God. So what gives us struggling in establishing a ministry, it is because we have we do not know the God we serve. So we just save by our mind or oh, we have passion to serve God, but we do not have any intimacy with God. We do not know his ways. We do not trust him. And, and sometimes we are afraid of trusting him because we can face a lot of persecutions. Because even when we see to people who now have great uh, ministries, they started very poorly and they uh, they get a lot of suffering. So a lot of us nowadays, young ministers, we do not have, we do not want to suffer. We do not have, uh, so that is what I think is a big problem mm. even for nowadays. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That is true. You know, uh, starting something, starting a ministry is a big step of faith and it is a journey of faith. Right? <laughs> we, it's, there, there are so many unknowns and uh, we have to take that step of faith and make the journey of faith and we can only do it if as you said our relationship with god is strong and that's very important definitely and out of that only out of that strong relationship we can step out good point harrison please good morning from here good morning in my ministry, I've seen um, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 22, or verse 23 to 24, you know, hurt a lot of young ministers. And another thing I've also seen is a lack of teamwork. Mm. A lack mm. of, and where there is no organization. And people tend to like you know show off you know they are show off what they can do, you not know, recognizing or realizing that there's a need for teamwork. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you begin to ask questions: Why is there no group? So these are some of the few things I've seen in ministry. Lack mm -hmm. of teamwork, our account and pride. Mm -hmm. so this are Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Harrison is highlighting uh, lack of teamwork as, you know, and I, I think it's very valid that uh, especially um, when you are starting a ministry or starting a church or any ministry, in, 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 whether in, in the city or elsewhere, it's important to be able to work with people, teamwork, you know. Uh, sometimes, uh, if, I mean, for, and, and we will talk about this as well. Sometimes it's difficult to find the right people. And sometimes, uh, even if you find the right people, you know, how do you work as a team and uh, uh, all those things? Those are very important. Yeah, good thoughts. Anybody else? Anybody else? Asha Rani talks about a sharing here on the chat. Uh, she mentions uh, miscommunication. Uh, and she lack, uh, mentions lack of planning, not well planned. That's true. It's true. Good. Prabhaka. Prabhaka shares on the chat here uh, questions. You know, uh, is it from God or is it from self? Uh, fear of facing the challenges. Mm, the ability to be consistent in this journey. And also the importance of faith. Yes. All these are important, uh, you know, points and you know, challenges that we face, you know, as we just think about stepping out, starting something, you know, and uh, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So thanks, thanks to everyone for sharing. You know, all of these things are our struggles we all face, you know, uh, and I think not only not only in 
the early stages, that is when you are starting out a ministry in the early stages, but I think even in, in, in later times in the ministry, uh, there are many of these things come. You know, for example, just this past Saturday, uh, we had a pastor's meeting here, and uh, we were discussing some new initiatives, you know, that uh, we are considering um, and all trusting God. And, uh, you know, the same things, you know, we go through. But of course, now uh, as a team, you know, so all of us are sitting together, uh, maybe about 20, 25 of us are sitting together and uh, we are praying and we are seeking God. You know, but similar things, you know, we want to be sure that these new initiatives in which we are going to announce to the church and invite people to participate, are, are these from God? Uh, second, what about the money to do these things, you know? Uh, and then, of course, we need to have a clear plan, execution plan. How are we going to do it? You know, uh, it can't be just random. It can't just uh, happen. So, uh, well, you know, so all these things. So even though, uh, you know, we have journeyed this far, as we think about these new things we are getting ready to move into, um, it's the same thing. You know, we have to come before God. Lord, we want your guidance. We want your direction. We, of course, we need the money to do it. Believe God for it. And then also uh, plan, execute well, have the right people to do it, you know, all those things. So uh, hopefully as we go through this course, uh, we will learn some things and, and we will be able to, you know, those of you, or those of us who are going to start ministries will be better positioned to start uh, and uh, later on, uh, we will be able to do some things. Now, I just want to, uh, Christopher, you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Pastor. Um, actually, two, uh, two questions or, you know, kind of, I guess, comments. Uh, one is with regards to, you know, um, you know, the, the sort of um, ministry that happens, uh, you know, in, in, in rural areas versus uh, urban. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I guess the, you know, the, the, the approach and the, you know, the strategy, um, you know, again, given by God and the guidance by God uh, may be different. And um, even the, even the, uh, you know, the people who are going into that, into those ministries may, re may require a different set of skills. Uh, you know, which, which uh, you know, just to get get that sort of reach and uh, you know that uh, thrust into the, into those areas. Uh, so, for example, I've I just just been a quick uh, Google search on India specifically. Uh, so, India is like sixty nine percent is still rural, and uh, you know the rest is is urban. Hmm. And I, as you mentioned earlier, that you know this this urban population that is that is sorry this rural population that is that is uh, going into in, into the urban areas and um, uh, I guess what my my question or my comment is uh, and again it's it maybe in my bigger question uh, you know historically and you know even the you know the, the, the missionaries and you know the people who who went into uh, you know into, into countries how they sort of you know uh, you know how they how do they get into you know, how, how did they choose between a rural and an urban? And what were some of the things that, uh, some of the characteristics of that population that uh, that helped, uh, you know, uh, to make that choice? I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm clearly uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, vocalizing what, I, what I'm trying to say over here. But that is one point. And the other point is, in the urban areas specifically, um, and uh, maybe I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, talking specifically, but Anglo, for example, where there are there are so many um, uh, ministries, so many churches, and um, just wanted to understand, you know, how that message possibly could, you know, uh, may get diluted, and uh, how, you know, within a within a certain geography. Or a city, 
you have uh, you know so, so many churches and they're all trying to uh, you know uh, be able to you know meet certain objectives and also be able to uh, operate as as ministries uh, you know um, under the umbrella of of, of God so uh, those those are the two broad areas yeah mm. okay I hope I understood your question correctly, but if in case I, I'm going off in the wrong direction, please stop me and please uh, correct me. Um, I think from the from, to answer your first question, you see, when in, when when initially when missionaries would go overseas to go to you know uh, developing countries, they say like coming to India and so on, the motivation was to take the gospel to those who have not yet heard. So that was one. And secondly, it was the approach was what we would refer to as social evangelism. That is, you address their felt needs. And this is something we which will also be a part of our strategy in urban context. But you know, just going back to the mission missionary context, it was to address a felt need, which was either medic medical, usually it was medical set up hospitals, educational, set up schools, or homes or orphanages, you know. So the approach was you address a felt need and you genuinely care for the people. And then through that, you bring them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in some cases, they also had to engage in language learning translation now I, or I should say in times past that was extremely important so uh, language and literacy uh, was 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 it's almost like the the stepping stone you know it was a prerequisite so when you look at missionary work in times past the motivation was let's take the gospel to those who have not yet heard the gospel and let's reach them through felt needs, uh, but language literacy, Bible translation was a necessary stepping stone. So you would sometimes you would have you know people and 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 and, and uh, you know we have ministries that are still doing this uh, for tribes or regions in our country where uh, the 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 language doesn't have a script and so on. They so they try to. You know, to, you know, first learn the language, so on, and then bring the gospel, bring the word of God into their language. So that was the process. Now, here we are, say about two hundred years later, to three hundred years later, since the you know the the, the major missions movements, um, and uh, things are slightly different because uh, there is there has been movement from rural to urban so on uh, technology has begun to penetrate even the rural areas so governments have set up schools hospitals a lot of things are there and so today the dynamics are a little different uh, so when you look at india itself in today to go set up a school in a village or it's a good thing i'm not saying it's not needed there are places where it's still needed but then there are other questions, you know, today people will question, why are you setting up a school? You know, why are you setting up a hospital? So on, you know, which was not the case, you know, 100 years ago. They would welcome schools and hospitals. Today they question, why are you doing it? You know, so the dynamics are different. Uh, so, uh, but the first, that's the first part of the question. The, the motivation in days past, days gone by was, let's reach people. Uh, who have not yet been reached and use you know these social means to you know enter their communities connect with them build relationship show that we love them care for them and then them you know and then share the gospel with them the second question and I, which i'm not sure if i understood clearly but i let me try to uh, speak something what i thought i understood was is um in the urban context yes so in a city like Bangalore, yes, there are hundreds of churches, probably, you know, maybe crossing a thousand mark as well. Um, but the city is so big, you know, so we have, we probably have more than 15 
we don't know the exact number, but let's just say, you know, more than 15 million people in Bangalore or the greater Bangalore area. And it's also very diverse. You know, we have people from different cultures, different languages, uh, different social strata uh, that are all here in the city. So one church cannot serve everybody, obviously, or even a hundred churches will not be able to serve everybody. We probably need thousands of churches that are serving, you know, um, different languages, different social strata, um, uh, different, of course, different parts of the city. So that's why we need, uh, you know, a, a multiplicity of churches, uh, even churches of the same kind, but located in different parts of the city, uh, to be able to reach such a densely populated region of people, right? Uh, the challenge, of course, like you pointed out, is to maintain a consistent message. You know, how do we all preach the gospel without fighting with each other? And how do we all uh, serve the same God in a way that's complementing each other, not competing with each other? That's the big challenge uh, from the church, within the church itself. So I hope I've uh, addressed both your questions, Christopher. And if I missed it, please let me know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think, yes, definitely you've, you've, uh, you've answered the question. Um, I think the only thing I, 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 I guess I, I just wanted to add is that uh, the, the profile of the, of the people in the urban areas uh, will obviously be different, um, uh, you know, from the point of view of, you know, possibly, you know, education and, you know, uh, more cost, more cosmopolitan, uh, more uh, you know, um, more more use of technology, you know, relative to the uh, to the uh, to the rural area, mm. and also I think, uh, uh, you know, they, they they are possibly more impactful, um, and being able to you know, um, spread the, the the you know the good news. Um, as well as um, you know, being in, in a different um, um, you know stri income strata, a strata also uh, to be able to manage you know uh, you know the, the 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 financial aspect, you know the, the funding and uh, the funds to you know, to be able to um, implement uh, you know the, some of these strategies. Yeah, so I just thought I'd add that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. And that is why I feel that urban churches also have a responsibility towards rural work, you know, so because the resources, of course, are in urban centers and therefore we should be more of a giving and ascending type church or a ministry because we have access to the resources. We should be able to, you know, support the work um, that's happening outside the rural centers. Yeah, good point. Okay, so thank you everyone for participating. Uh, it's interesting to hear your comments and ideas and thoughts. Appreciate that. That's going to take this a little forward here. Um, so we we understand, you know, that there is a struggle here all of us face in uh, doing starting a ministry, uh, especially in the urban context. And we will hopefully in this course learn some of these things. Okay, now how to overcome and how to work through these challenges. Now, let's go forward. Let's start talking about church planting. And uh, like I said last class, um, uh, our, our focus in this course is on church planting. That means starting a local church. But things that we learned could be applied even to starting a different kind of Christian ministry. You know, it doesn't have to be a local church. It could be something else. Now, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, uh, which we are all familiar, Jesus said, you know, all authority is given unto him, unto him in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, Bapt you know, baptizing, teaching them to observe all things uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus told us, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. Go to the whole world, make disciples. So you and I have this commission 
to make disciples of all nations. Now, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he didn't actually tell us how to do it. He just said, go do it, right? So then we'll have to look into the book of Acts to see what happens. You know, there was, of course, the great empowering of the Holy Spirit that came to help the early disciples go out and fulfill the Great Commission. So they went out preaching and so on. But what we see unfold in the book of Acts is the establishing of local communities of believers. So this is key. This is very key, very important. In the fulfilling of the Great Commission. That is, there is the establishing of communities of believers. Whether they went to villages, towns, or cities, wherever they went, they established communities of believers, which we call as local church, which the Bible refers to as the local church or the house of God, different terms. Right? But essentially, what is a local church? It is a community of believers. That is, this, this, this grouping, this coming together of these believers, people who have made a decision to believe in Christ, and they are going in some way to share life. They're going to do things together. They're going to grow together. They're going to journey together. And they, in turn, are going to be, they are going to be nurtured and equipped. Um, and they are going to continue to make more disciples in those regions and beyond. Right? So that is what we see happening in the book of Acts. So the Great Commission fulfilling the Great Commission results in the establishing of these communities of believers, or what we would call as church plants, if you want to use a technical term. Some people don't like it. It's okay. It doesn't matter. It's referring to these communities of believers. And ideally, these are self-sustaining communities. That means uh, when the gospel, when, when there may be a messenger, there may be a person who comes into a city or a village or a town bringing the message of the gospel. Uh, but then the community of believers that is established there are able to continue by themselves, right? They're not dependent on somebody else bringing the gospel to them. You know, it, it started with somebody else, but bringing the gospel to them. But then now they become self-sustaining. Leaders are being nurtured, are equipped, and the work is going on. And then they are able to uh, make more disciples. So our objective here in, in, is this, right? A church plant is this establishing of these self-sustaining communities of believers. They are growing together as disciples of Jesus Christ. They are hosting God's presence in wherever they are. And they are influencing their region so that they can bring more people and nurture more people in as disciples of Jesus. Right? So that's what we're talking to, what we mean when we say church plant. What is a church plant? It's the establishing of these self-sustaining communities of believers, right? That are growing together, they're hosting God's presence, they're influencing the region, and this whole thing keeps on happening. More people are coming to faith in Christ, they're being nurtured as disciples, and it's going on and on. And very often, the influence of that community goes beyond their region. They may plant churches outside and beyond their region. Additionally, when we say self-sustaining, we mean there to be self-sustaining in leadership. That means you know leaders should be raised from amongst themselves. They should be self-sustaining financially. That means, uh, to whatever extent possible, money should come from you know amongst themselves to to keep this work going in practical ways. And they also they should be self-sustaining as a community, meaning. It shouldn't die off with one generation. Uh, it should keep going, generation after generation. The, 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 the gospel continues to abide and increase in that place. Right? So it's going on. So that's, these are things that we need to keep in mind as we plant churches. Uh, so. And I, and I want to present this to you, that when you plant a church, 
or in fact even if you start a Christian ministry think in terms of doing something that's self-sustaining that's going to continue you know sometimes people like they go to a place they do ministry for two years three years and they leave and everything just dies out after they leave and then you're wondering like okay you know so much investment was made in those two to three years I'm not saying nobody was touched of course definitely some lives were touched but were they thinking of just doing something for two to three years or were they thinking of something of establishing something that would continue for the long term you know I would like to impress on us the importance of establishing something with the long term in mind that should be our desire Lord if I plant a church if I start a ministry may it be for the long term you know of course there may be some things that God may want you to do temporarily it's okay fine but I'm not saying that never happens but especially when it comes to planning of churches think long term think beyond yourself beyond your lifetime think about establishing something in that community that will continue on to impact generations to come right self-sustaining which means leadership financially community wise they need to be able to continue for the long term okay so what are the objectives we're looking at in church planting we want to establish uh, communities that can host God's presence we want to be able to disciple new believers that means new people are coming when they come in they should automatically know that discipling should happen they come into a community and people are telling them you know you how to pray how to read the word and how to grow in the faith and how they can get equipped themselves uh, so that they can then become very fruitful people you know so this it should I, I use the word automatically I mean it should just happen as people are being brought in they should also be influencing their region so the church is not you know an isolated unit uh, of people who are cut off from their society no they are people who are influencing their society so you have to think about that when you plant a church I also want to equip these people to influence their region you know if it's a city influence the city you know and then additionally we should be multiplying we should plant more churches whether planting more churches in that same city or planting more churches in other cities right so in church planting these are some of the objectives we are going after establishing communities where the God's presence is brought into that region where people are brought to faith and discipled where the society around is influenced and where multiplication can happen from this community to plant more churches that's what we're going to try to seek to learn how to do how to make this happen in a practical way right so let's pause here tomorrow we'll talk about God's heart for cities and how we must have the heart of God for cities uh, before we close I wanted to see if there are any questions any comments here so far any questions on this on what our objectives are in church planting what are we trying to do? Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. All right. So let's take a moment. I'm assuming every if you're keeping quiet, uh, me, I think you've understood it, right? So there are no questions. So uh, I, I, I think everyone is on is together. Uh, Shikumar, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, I just want to know establishing and hosting God's presence. Is it um, um, uh, preparing the believers uh, to or in the Word of God and in worship? Is it means that? Or? Mm, so it's the second, it's the latter part, meaning um, the, this community of believers, they're engaging in prayer, in worship and in the word so they become 
a community among whom God is dwelling. Right? So we're not just gathering people for uh, having a crowd on Sundays. We're not just gathering people for some social activity. No. We're gathering a people among whom God dwells. That happens through prayer, and the worship, and the word. Yeah. Thank you. Maggie. Maggie, your question, please. Thank you, sir. Um, it said here, yeah, when we establish church or plant church, we we establish God's presence in, in, in the believer and in, in that environment. Um, can church plants, plants uh, be regarded as a, a revival to a region or to a village of people who didn't know God first and now they, they received him? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could happen, and it sometimes does happen, um, through revival, where there is a movement of people, and usually it's many people, into the kingdom of God in a short period of time. It could happen, but it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it could be one soul, two people, Three people slowly they are being brought to the kingdom of God, right? And then eventually a community of believers is established. So it can happen both ways. It can happen uh, in, in in the sovereign move of the Holy Spirit as in as in a revival that sweeps many people into the kingdom of God, which is wonderful. Or it could happen in ones, twos, threes, progressively increasing. You know, but what happens eventually? In both cases, a community of believers is established where people are praying, worshipping, engaging with the Word of God, and becoming the house of God in that place. And God is dwelling among them, moving. They are the carriers of God's presence in that community. Yeah. Okay, Hope, your question, please. Yeah, go ahead, Hope. You can ask your question. Hope, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay, it was not a question. All right, never mind. Okay, everyone, um, we'll uh, close in prayer. And tomorrow we will talk about getting the heart of God for our cities. Um, or you could say towns or villages, wherever you are, in the community where you are, you know, capturing uh, the heart of God. So Kennedy's question, what is the role of outreaches and crusades in church? Uh, I think it's very important, Kennedy. Uh, it is something every church must be involved in, in reaching out. The only thing is, which we will talk about later in this course, is it has to, it will change, or it varies depending on where we are doing the outreach, where we are planting the church, uh, and we have to tailor that outreach or the crusade to where we are planting the church. Example, in the city of Bangalore, today if we want to plant a church, we would not do the traditional gospel crusade, we wouldn't do that. Maybe, I would say, maybe 25, 30 years ago, having a gospel crusade in the city of Bangalore was relevant. Today, having a gospel crusade is no longer relevant. You know, if you rent a, rent a state, I mean, rent a big ground and preach the gospel, you know, it's no longer relevant. Why? First, uh, 90 to 95 percent of people who will come would already be, be believers. So you're not really reaching the people you want to reach. Secondly, uh, the environment in, the, in, 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 I'm just using Bangalore City as an example. The environment here is not conducive because there's a lot of anti conversion, anti Christian sentiment. So, they, you know, the government may not even give permission for something like that. 
So, so things have changed in the last, last 30 years. So if somebody wants to plant a church in the city of Bangalore, today the strategies would be different. You know, we have to look at other ways in which you penetrate and reach people in the city. Right? But it, you know, it, it'll vary from city to city depending on what's happening. But the point is we still have to reach out. We'll have to come up with strategies that, reach, that can reach the multitudes of people. And we'll have to, by the Holy Spirit, look for ways to do that. Okay. All right, so let's close in prayer. May I request somebody to please pray, and then we will pause for today. Go ahead. Okay. Father and our God, we want to thank you because we know that all we have heard this morning, the outcome of this evening, it is by your will and your grace that we love them. We thank you for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate you joining the class. I'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, have a good rest of the day. God bless each of you. Thank you. God bless. It's good to see you all again. Thank you.